thank you for joining the special seminar today. Uh, my name is Shuji Urata, Chairman of Rieti and Professor Emeritus at Waseda University. I will be serving as a moderator for uh, this seminar. Today, we are truly honored to welcome Dr. Marcus Noland, Executive Vice President and Director of Studies at Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., and also non-resident senior fellow at East West Center in Hawaii. Dr. Nolan's research covers a wide range of topics, including economics, political science, international relations. His areas of geographical knowledge and interest include Asia, Africa, where he has lived and worked, uh, and the Middle East. He has written extensively on the economies of Japan, Korea, and China, and is unique among American economists in having devoted serious scholarly effort to the problems of North Korea and the prospects for Korean unification. He won Ohira Memorial Award for his book, uh, Avoiding Apocalypse, uh, The Future of the Two Koreans, and his most recent book titled Hard Target, Sanctions, Inducements, and Case of North Korea. Uh, personally, I've known Dr. Nolan for about 40 years, so it's very nice to have him here. Uh, Dr. Nolan will deliver a lecture titled North Korea as a Complex Humanitarian Emergency. After Dr. Nolan's presentation, Dr. Katsuhisa Kurukawa will provide commentary. Dr. Furukawa is well known to many of us in Japan uh, from frequent appearances on TV as a commentator on North Korean issues. Uh, Dr. Furukawa is a consultant and independent investigator of global sanctions issues, an open source intelligence analyst, and a writer on national security affairs. He was a member of the UN panel of experts monitoring the UN sanctions against North Korea. Prior to this position, he held many important positions at places like Japan Science and Technology Agency and others. Uh, after Dr. Furukawa's uh, comments, uh, we will have time for questions and answers until 1.15. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Nolan to make uh, his presentation. Thank you very much. It's a deep honor to be here today. It is especially gratifying to be sandwiched between two gentlemen for whom I have such high respect. Uh, Professor Urata, as he mentioned, uh, we've known each other uh, for a very long time uh, when we both had more hair. Um, <laughs> Dr. Furukawa, I'm not going to talk about his work today in my presentation, but on things that I've written on North Korea, I've used extensive, uh, I've made extensive use of his uh, uh, deep analysis of things like satellite imagery to understand uh, the situation in North Korea better. Today, um, I'm going to um, describe North Korea as a complex humanitarian emergency. Well, what do we mean by that? Complex humanitarian emergency is a situation often characterized by a uh, reduction or collapse in the institutions of domestic civil governance, oftentimes accompanied by internal civil strife, um, that results in long-term widespread suffering and death, often requiring external intervention to stabilize the situation and provide a basis of development going forward. We would think of places like Haiti today, um, maybe Afghanistan at times, um, countries like this uh, that would be um, a kind of um, traditional uh, complex humanitarian emergencies. North Korea is distinct in that it is a, it is a 
complex humanitarian emergency characterized by chronic suffering of the population and elevated death rates, but it's occurring not in a state that's collapsed, but in a state that is actually hard, that is uh, very effective at pursuing its agenda. It's simply an agenda that does not put the welfare of the average person at a very high priority. I'm going to review quantity and price evidence on the issue of food insecurity, which is at the center of this emergency for North Korea. Um, I'm not going to go into the satellite photography and some of the other techniques that people like uh, Dr. Furukawa have used, um, but I will focus on quantity and price analysis. But I also will touch on legal and institutional changes that are occurring in North Korea. Typically, when one thinks of famines like the one that North Korea experienced in the 1990s, um, in socialist countries, the incidence of food insecurity and death is politically determined uh, because your access to food is, is in itself politically determined. In market economies, your ability to access food is determined by your ability to command uh, prices in the marketplace. Uh, in the 1990s, the North Korean famine started out as a kind of socialist famine, but then morphed as the economy marketized into a more market famine that we would observe in market-based countries. Uh, I'll argue that these uh, legal and institutional changes that are occurring are having the effect of moving the food economy from a, a relatively marketized economy back to an economy characterized by much higher degree of state control. And then finally, I'll turn to some longer run questions. Okay, quickly though, the context. There is a strategic context uh, to this situation. North Korea has embraced uh, nuclear weapons. It is under a number of UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, initially, these targeted uh, arms and were aimed at luxury goods and could be, de could be portrayed as being defensive in nature and kind of smart in the targeting of the elite. Um, those have not worked particularly well. Uh, and since 2017, when there were uh, intercontinental ballistic missile tests and nuclear tests, uh, the sanctions have been broadened. So now they, they clearly affect large swaths of the North Korean economy and have effects on uh, large parts of the North Korean public. Due to international diplomatic changes, Russia and China now block any further action in the UN Security Council. So as people here in Japan would know, despite the North Koreans uh, launching lots of missiles in the last year, uh, there have been no additional sanctions or UN Security Council resolutions. The big test will come if North Korea conducts a seventh nuclear test. Uh, will the UN be able to act? or will we be back to essentially coalitions of the willing attempting to um, uh, 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 constrain North Korea's behavior? That the cyber um, the sanctions invasion is increasingly cyber oriented and um, which is something I will touch on before moving on to the, the core issue of food insecurity. So the question is, they have this enormous military, they're doing all this uh, nuclear testing and missile testing, how do they pay for it? Uh, their conventional exports are minimal, and even if one accepts there's a certain amount of uh, sanctions evasion, they simply don't, the numbers don't add up. They don't make enough money to be paying for, for all this activity. Historically, they've had a variety of illicit forms of um, illicit forms of revenue, things like counterfeiting, drug trafficking, and so on. But again, there's been fairly serious attempts to interdict and, and constrain those sources of revenue, and it looks like they don't make enough money through those sources to fund these military programs. Increasingly, it is cyber-oriented, abetted by the rise of cryptocurrencies. The cryptocurrencies are an important part of the story because they allow the North Koreans to launder their funds that they get through cybercrime more easily than they could in the past. And as you see on the slide, there's a brief chronology showing some of the uh, uh, major attacks. Most recently, the firm Chain Analysis put uh, 
total 2022 revenue at $1.7 billion. I was recently speaking to someone from another cybersecurity firm who thinks that estimate is low. Uh, and Newbert Berger, the uh, national security advisor in the United States, uh, the deputy national security advisor in the U.S. for cyber, uh, claimed that cyber uh, has, is financing as much as a third of the missile program, and that was last year. And there is now a claim floating around Washington, which on the slide I label echo chamber, because once somebody invokes the figure, it gets repeated. I don't know where this number comes from, but the claim floating around Washington is that cybercrime accounts for 40% of GDP. Now, what is, the, what is the more conventional economic context for the food insecurity situation? Well, North Korea was already struggling, uh, and then it was hit with wide-ranging sanctions in 2017, as I mentioned. That was further intensified by the country's self-isolating response to the global pandemic. Uh, what the North Koreans did was they closed the borders. And they accomplished what we could not accomplish, which was cutting them off from international trade. Uh, they did to themselves. Um, it appeared that they ran out of money in April 2020 and started um, issuing, well, they had a big bond issuance. And then later in the year, they started issuing what, what in English we call script. That is not real money. It's a kind of promissory note from the government. And normally, in, in situations where script is issued, it trades at a discount to actual money. So for example, in the United States during the Great Depression, some state governments couldn't pay state employees like teachers. And so rather than paying them in dollars, they paid them in these kind of government notes, which some merchants would accept as payment and some merchants wouldn't. Uh, so the North Koreans were reduced to issuing script. Um, in a series of... Uh, political meetings, they, there was a move back towards a more state-oriented economy. North Korea goes through periods that kind of waxes and wanes, allowing a certain amount of liberalization in the economy and then pulling it back. Right now, we're in one of those cycles of pulling it back. So in the 8th uh, Workers' Party of Korea Congress in January 2021, there was a call for recentralization, call for revival of he heavy industry. Then the, they did crackdowns on inst procedures and institutions that allowed North Korean enterprises and households to kind of act in a market-oriented way. Before, the, uh, before our program went on the air, we were having a lunch and we were discussing these unusual terms that come up in North Korean economy. So they have things like the waku and the kiji, which are which actually taken from Japanese language, um, which are institutions that were developed for one purpose but have been repurposed in a more market-oriented way. So um, if you have a quota, if you're a state-owned enterprise and you have a quota that allows you to trade, uh, uh, most likely in China, uh, you can use that quota for trading, not just for trading your own stuff, but for example, buying consumer goods that your employees can then sell to their, to their neighbors. So it's repurposing an institution for, um, for a more market-oriented way. Well, they've been cracking down on that. Most importantly for our talk, throughout 2021, there were a variety of signals coming out that there was something going wrong in the food economy. Uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, in April of that year, invoked the arduous march, which is Korea's code word for the 1990s famine, which killed probably somewhere between 600,000 to a million people, or about 3 to 5 percent of the pre-famine population. Uh, there were meetings that were focused on agriculture, and we have scattered reports of hunger-related deaths. This is a very bleak picture. The one positive thing is with the uh, diminution of the global pandemic, the North Koreans are in the process of reopening their borders, and in recent months, trade figures have gone up. But in agriculture, there have been um, this tightening is manifested in a series of laws that I've written in, uh, in uh, that slide. And what those laws do is they 
increased direct state control over both the, the procurement of grain and its distribution to households. What had been happening was cooperative farms were, were, once they made their quotas, they were allowed to sell food into the market. And most North Koreans get their food from the market. There used to be something called the public distribution system. It, it was a quantity rationing system where each month a household would get a quantity ration. Um, that system collapsed in some parts of the country in the late 80s. It had collapsed nationwide by the early 1990s. It continues to uh, work, but only for some elites, some party members or, say, key people at a nuclear facility. They can still obtain food from the old PDS system, but for the vast bulk of the population, they're buying their food in the market. Well, what the North Koreans have done over the last year or so is is remove the ability of the cooperative farms to sell their food. It all has to go straight to the state. And now, while the state is continuing to operate the PDS in this very small way, what it's doing with that food is channeling it into state markets where it is sold to the population with a subsidy component, but a much smaller subsidy the component than the PDS, and with some restrictions on how much households can buy. So basically, the market-oriented parts of the food economy are being uh, eradicated. And what that means is food insecurity among households is once again shifting from your ability to command resources in the market and purchase food to your political priority. If you are a low political priority, you may not have access to food. So now I'm going to move on to some numbers. And I'm going to start with quantities. And I'm going to use the usual quantity uh, grain balance methodology that is used by the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization. It starts with asking what is domestic availability. That is to say, what is the domestic uh, 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 production or harvest? And that's important. In North Korea, about two-thirds of the food consumed in North Korea is produced locally. So the domestic harvest matters. Then the FAO asks about total utilization. The single biggest component is food use by human beings, but you also have feed use for livestock, seed requirements, what is um, gently described as post-harvest losses, which can involve everything from uh, grain rotting in the fields because they don't have the ability to get it to a warehouse to what is more likely, which is the farmers on the, on the cooperatives stealing the grain and hoarding it for their own consumption. Um, and then there's obviously an inventory or stock component. They look at imports, both uh, commercial imports and aid, and then they calculate an uncovered deficit. And there are uncertainties about all these components. The most important one, uh, well, the two are they're important, and I'll go through each of them in a bit of detail. One is production, how much food is actually being grown, and the other is how much is actually consumed by human beings. On that first issue, how much food is being produced, there are three sources of data. The Food and Agricultural Organization, the Korean Rural Development Administration, the South Korean Rural Development Administration, and the United States Department of Agriculture. And what I've done in that uh, chart is define uh, the composition of grain with respect to what's there, rice, corn, barley, and so on, in a consistent way over time, so we can compare these three sources. And what you see is the FAO looks different than the, food and agri uh, than the um, KRDA or USDA. The FAO has some advantages and it has some disadvantages. The advantages that the FAO has is that they are able to actually visit cooperative or state farms in uh, North Korea. They're actually able to see what's going on on the ground. The disadvantage is it is a diplomatic relationship and they are obliged to not write down what the North Korean authorities tell them, but at least take what the North Korean authorities say seriously. So what you will see is the FAO's figures show greater volatility. They tend to be higher in good times and lower in bad times. Some people believe this reflects North Korean decision-making to exaggerate accomplishments when there are accomplishments to exaggerate, 
And then once the decision is made to seek aid, to try to, to, to make it look as bad as possible in order to maximize aid inflows. The United States and South Korea do not have direct access. They estimate these, th uh, these uh, production using uh, satellite imagery, including infrared imagery to estimate yields, as well as the maintenance of model farms in border regions. And you will see that those two series are much more closely aligned. They also show less volatility. It may be because actual output is less volatile, or it may simply reflect human nature. In an uncertain situation, you're going to hedge your bets. You're not going to say something is too high or too low. You're going to say it's kind of in the middle. All right, those are the three sources of data. And there's basically two alternatives, FAO and then the US and South Korean sources. The next slide puts these things all together. It shows you uh, the North Korean grain balances estimated on the uh, left-hand side using the UN figures, and on the right-hand side using uh, the uh, US and Cor Korean figures for production, and then adjusting human consumption. There's an Australian economist named Heather Smith made a devastating critique of the FAO's and WFP, the World Food Program's methodology for estimating human consumption in North Korea back in the late 90s and concluded they had overestimated the role of grains in the North Korean diet by about 20%. So what I do in the other uh, graph is to do the kind of Smith adjustment on human use, and that brings down the overall needs. Well, what does this all mean? This slide shows you two estimates of the North Korean grain balance. You have the one that's in sort of dark blue, if I can get this pointer to work. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Um, ah, here we go, here we go. Okay, we've got the dark blue line. This is the result you get when you use the UN data. And what, uh, excuse me, the teal colored line is the UN data. M my mistake. So this is the line you get for the, for the net balance if you use the UN data. And what you can see is, according to the United Nations, uh, North Korea has only been in surplus two years in the last 25. This, just, this doesn't pass the, the, what we call the laugh test or the smell test. If, if, that U, if those UN estimates were correct, then North Korea would be in almost continuous famine, and nobody, nobody alleges that. If you look at the dark blue line, that's the one that I've constructed using the alternative sources uh, for supply estimates and then the adjustment about human consumption, you get what I think is a much more plausible story. You start out with a big deficit, about a million and a half tons during the famine period. Then on the back of a lot of aid, you go into surplus and you do pretty well. As aid starts to decline because people get tired of providing it, North Korea occasionally gets in the trouble. When the world price of grain is high, North Korea gets in the trouble because uh, uh, countries do not supply as much to them because they're, especially China, because they're worried about uh, domestic consumption, domestic prices at home. And what you see in the recent years, if you follow my line out, is that I estimate that North Korea now is running a deficit uh, in the year before last of about 400,000 metric tons. And last year may have been even worse. Uh, there are now um, estimates of grain coming into North Korea via China, but they do not appear big enough to make a material difference. So the bottom line from the quantity work is that it appears that North Korea has a problem, uh, that this is the biggest deficit they've experienced since the famine period of the 1990s. Well, I'm an economist, so what about prices? And again, there's two sources of data. There's the Daily NK, which is uh, a press group run uh, in part by North Korean refugees in uh, Seoul, Korea. And then there's Asia Press uh, operating uh, here in Japan out of Osaka. Uh, the Daily NK reports, uh, and they both use uh, uh, surreptitious reporting by respondents in North Korea operating on the uh, Chinese cell phone network. Uh, Daily NK reports uh, data for three cities, uh, Shinuiju, Pyongyang, and Haisan, which you can see on the map. Uh, Asia Press, uh, most of their data comes from uh, 
uh, North Hamgyong province, and a number of other provinces, as well as some unnamed uh, um, locations. And what I will show you is data for uh, corn, rice, and the parallel exchange rate market. So uh, rice, uh, prices of rice and corn in North Korea. You can see uh, there is um, a dotted line uh, in, in this uh, graph at uh, the time of the border closure, January 2020. And as you can see, there is some pattern of price increase after the border is closed, particularly in the case of corn. There is also some evidence of increased volatility of prices after the border closure. And as you will see in a moment, there is also some evidence of uh, increased dispersion across, of prices across cities. One of the things uh, we look at when we're trying to assess stress in North Korea is the, is the relative price of corn to rice. Rice is the more expensive preferred good. Corn is the less expensive, uh, uh, less preferred good. If you see the price of corn rising relative to rice, uh, it can be interpreted as a signal of distress because liquidity-constrained households are stopping eating rice and switching into corn. And you see some evidence of an increase in the relative price um, after the border closure. The problem is this period also coincides with a rise in the relative price of corn to rice globally. The price of corn globally is way up. The price of rice has actually been fairly stable over the last few years. So it's hard to disentangle how much of this effect is due to distress within North Korea, how much of it is due to um, the world market. When we look at uh, exchange rates, we find, not surprisingly, that they are more highly correlated uh, both across data sources and across cities than uh, grain. It's easier to arbitrage price differences for money than it is a physical good. Um, the prices are highly correlated across um, uh, all cities. Um, there are some evidence that um, cross-city price dispersion has increased after the closure of the border. It, if you go back a, a longer p uh, sweep of time, you can see that over time, what happened in North Korea was the domestic food market prices, differences across regions were, were declining. Essentially, a truly integrated national market was being built. What this uh, evidence suggests is that process has gone into reverse. So there is some evidence of higher prices, and there are, there's evidence of high prices relative either to the world, uh, that is up in the upper panels, or, or, to, or to China, uh, which is the, the location of most imports in the lower, uh, lower uh, panels. So essentially, food prices in North Korea are high and they're rising. It has been made worse by the pandemic and war. Um, the, the border closure is obviously the biggest issue, and in the interest of time, I'll skip over uh, the pandemic situation just to say that uh, North Korea's um, uh, policies have been curious. Um, the war has, has had a problem, and it's contributed to the adverse rise in global prices. It's pushed China, Russia, and North Korea closer together diplomatically, and of course we have the specter now of North Korea selling arms, potentially providing personnel, um, to Putin's war effort in the Ukraine and the recent meeting which suggests a swap of food and energy uh, and military technology for uh, arms for the Ukraine war. So what is the most likely uh, scenarios? In the short run, uh, there'll be a kind of muddling through. Um, there's a weakening of the sanctions coalition. There's a de facto acceptance of North Korea as a nuclear uh, power. And then we have what I call the levitating North Korean economy, this economy that seems to operate with greater expenditures than revenue, presumably uh, filling the gap through cybercrime. Uh, in the longer term, um, there are issues uh, with attitudes in both South Korea and Japan and willingness to, uh, uh, you know, how much, uh, you know, uh, uh, willingness are these countries to go against North Korea and China? Um, and there's the ever-present possibility of an East German-style collapse and absorption. In the longer run, will North Korea uh, turn decisively 
towards reform? Well, oddly, the international environment is kind of uh, supportive, enabling of the maintenance of these suboptimal policies, uh, getting backstop and support from China and um, uh, um, Russia. That said, uh, Kim Jong-un is still a relatively young man, and if he wants to die in his bed, as his father did as the king of North Korea, then uh, he may eventually have to take more decisive action. So we're, we're in a studio here, and there's no live audience, so to speak. Normally, this slide gets, gets a big laugh. It's, it's not meant to be a joke. It's actually the most serious. If there's one thing you remember from today, my presentation today, remember this. So on the, uh, on the left, you have Eric Schmidt, uh, the man in the red scarf. He was at that time the executive chairman of Google, one of the world's most dynamic technology uh, companies, and he visited Pyongyang. Did, um, did uh, Kim Jong-un have time to meet with him? No. Kim Jong-un appears to have sent him to an unheated room so that he could see a soldier, uh, you know, uh, look at a computer monitor. However, when the, um, and I want to be careful what I say here. I don't want to be mean. Um, mental health challenged retired American basketball player Dennis Rodman came to visit. Uh, he came to visit multiple times, and as you can see from the photo on the right, uh, Kim Jong-un had plenty of time for him. To me, these two experiences tell me volumes about Kim Jong-un's uh, values, his priorities, and frankly, his, uh, uh, um, his uh, qualification for leadership. So, where, does this, where do we end? We have this very strange situation where we have a c complex humanitarian emergency, but it's in a belligerent state. We have evidence that changes in the food economy in North Korea mean that the incidence of food insecurity is becoming increasingly politically determined, which is echoes the old system that produced a terrible famine in the 1990s. There's a lack of internal accountability and external enablement, primarily by China and Russia, allow North Korea to, to maintain this contradiction. And so the country is likely to muddle through, but it is at enormous cost to the population. Um, a, a, about a year or so ago, a friend of mine named Gordon Flake, who many of you probably know, uh, who's now based at the University of Western Australia in Perth, Australia, came to Washington and visited me in my office. Gordon and I had visited North Korea together in 1997 during the famine. And we looked, at we looked across the desk at each other, and we said, if someone had come to us um, 25 years ago and said, you will be studying the exact same set of issues and problems in North Korea now, um, in 25 years hence that you are now, we would have thought they're crazy. But here we are, still dealing with chronic food insecurity, external belligerence, and questions about the basic future of the country. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing the comments uh, from uh, my good friend, um, Dr. Uh, Furukawa. Thank you very much, Dr. Nolan, for a very interesting presentation.